Hello everyone. So I'm going to continue um, my uh, lecture about parliamentary sovereignty uh, in relation to uh, English law. Um, anyway, so we know that uh, Parliament is the highest lawmaker in the United Kingdom. That's the Parliament of the UK, not just the Scots Parliament. Um, and um, the Parliament has legal paramountcy. But there are certain political realities. They couldn't just get anything passed, could they? We, we, we've got to bear in mind that even if you have a huge majority, um, then uh, some of your MPs might rebel. Um, so some people think that there is a self-imposed uh, limitation according to the European Communities Act of 1972. But of course, the United Kingdom left the European Union several months ago. So do those limitations still pertain? I would argue not, but there are uh, legal scholars who know far more than I ever shall who say otherwise. So there are certain uh, statutes which are constitutional ones, as per the um, Thoburn, I think it's Thoburn, not Thoburn, case of 2002. Remember the metric martyr I cited him before, the chap who wanted to sell um, uh, fruit in ounces and pounds, saying that his customers understood this, back off Brussels, he didn't want to have to use the metric system. Um, Anyway, so we have to look at the uh, impact of the Human Rights Act today, which was passed in uh, 1998 and took effect in the year 2000. We'll look at um, devolution and how that has influenced parliamentary sovereignty, possibly um, trammeled it. Uh, we'll look at Jackson and um, the idea of common law constitutionalism. So starting off with, with um, what are the most common concerns going back some way, uh, so Lord Scarman, that celebrated judge of the 70s and 80s, he wrote English Law, the New Dimension in 1974. So note that came out just after the United Kingdom had joined the European Economic Community, EEC, which metamorphosed into the European Union. And um, his lordship had the following to say. It is the helplessness of the law in the face of a legislative supremacy of Parliament, which makes it difficult for the legal system to accommodate the concept of fundamental and inviolable human rights. Because if there are such, close quotation, if there are such rights, because they could simply be abrogated by Parliament passing a statute to do so. Um, anyway, so the Human Rights Act, there's an interpretive duty, according to Section 4 of the said Act, um, uh, to certify whether there's incompatibility with the European Convention on Human Rights. If a public authority is acting incompatibly, the public authorities have to act in consonance with the um, European Convention on Human Rights insofar as it's possible to do so. That's for the legislation. So it might be it might be the case that not, it's not entirely possible to do so. So they could be in breach of the European Convention of Human Rights. Now, uh, the, the, the court having said there's incompatibility here, um, that doesn't mean that, that something is illegal or something is undone. It's up to Parliament to rectify it, which they might choose not to do. So looking looking at Section 4 of the Human Rights Act, about these, these declarations of incompatibility which can be made by a court, and so courts, they cannot strike down uh, primary legislation. But um, anyway, so remedial action can be taken to amend the law. Um, as Anthony Bradley said, the Act is a very long way towards enabling there to be judicial review of legislation in all but name. So, OK, they, they, they can't quash the law, but uh, Parliament is likely to amend it if this is this is this case. So what does this do to parliamentary supremacy? Is something repealed impliedly? There are those who argue that it is. Um, OK, so uh, what should prevail here? It's difficult to say. There was a case, A and others, um, the, the, the Belmarsh case, about this Belmarsh being a prison um, in London. Anyway, there are more uh, controversial issues surrounding this. So devolution, the Scotland Act 1998, passed pursuant to a 1997 referendum, saying that a Scottish Parliament should be re-established. Scotland would remain within the United Kingdom, but this new Parliament at Holyrood in Edinburgh would legislate on most matters for North Britain. And it was set up the Scottish Executive. Now that later changed its name to the Scottish Government, and it has that name to this day. So it says, uh, this section does not affect the power of Parliament of the UK to make laws for Scotland, i.e. the UK Parliament could still do so. So uh, there are certain um, reserve powers that only Westminster can make laws on. That's the Parliament in London for the whole of the UK, in which, of course, Scotland is still represented. Um, but if there's some sort of collision, um, could could Parliament just override the Scottish Parliament? It's arguable. So there's Acts Insurance and Lord Advocate in 2011, a famous case which established the Sewell Convention. There again are certain political realities to be to be taken into account, 
Remember the Scotland Act in 2016, which um, upgraded um, a devolution to, to Devo Max. So um, sovereignty, that's rightful power over a territory. Remember, sovereign also meant that the, the monarch and, and um, coinage was called, uh, coins were called sovereigns, had the sovereign's head on them, but that was quite a symbol of sovereignty. One of the reasons why the United Kingdom was so reluctant to scrap the pound sterling and use the euro as its currency if people felt that would be really the, the nail in the coffin of independence. Um, so there's Jackson, an attorney general, a, a celebrated case from 2005, and this uh, was a challenge to the validity of the act. Uh, it was about the hunting act, um, but uh, so this is hunting with dogs to outlaw hunting with, with, with hounds. But anyway, it failed. OK, it was seen to be a justiciable issue. Um, that uh, you you can't you can't block this act and the claim that it's breaching our human rights. You, the parliament is entitled to outlaw hunting with hounds. So let's look somewhat into the background. Normal acts they go through the House of Commons and the House of Lords. They are signed by the monarch, la reine le veut. That's it, the queen wants it. That's the announcement made in French, and then it is law. Now, now the thing is, sometimes it's, it's law from that moment it doesn't necessarily take effect. Sometimes it doesn't take effect for a year or two later, and it'll say that in the legislation because we need to um, prepare ourselves to come into line with it. Remember, the Parliament Act of 2011 reduced the Lord's um, power to veto to two years and removed it from money, money bills altogether. Of course, the Parliament Act 1949 reduced it to one year. Now, because of the parliamentary timetable, um, uh, uh, the Commons seldom, seldom rams things through against the Lord's opposition because, yes, you, you'd have to, um, you, you can ram it through after just a year delay, but that's more difficult because you've got this parliamentary timetable. So you prefer to do things in agreement with the Lords with, um, with at least accepting a few of their amendments. So the Parliament Act is procedural. Uh, so you can have just, you can take the House of Lords out of it, they can defeat it. 100% of them can vote against it, but you can still get it through just after a year's delay. So the House of Commons and, and the monarch agreeing only, not the House of Lords. So um, anyway, uh, so it's, it's in three sessions. That's uh, that's two years. It was originally the Parliament Act 1911 said that. As I say, it's down to one year, according to the Parliament Act of 1949. All right, so let's look at what Jackson's argument is about this. Um, this is in relation to the, to the Hunting with um, Dogs Act and a Jackson and Attorney General. He said that the um, Parliament Act 1949 was not a valid piece of legislation. And because of that, and because the, the Parliament Act 1949 was passed, in sort of was invoked in order to get this um, hunting act through quicker, he said that because it was passed 1949 um, using the wrong procedure. Um, so, um, uh, the, 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 so, and that, that meant that only the House of Commons need to approve legislation. So because the Parliament Act 1949 was invalid, therefore the Hunting Act in 2004 was invalid. But um, anyway, there were two crucial arguments to, to evaluate here. First of all, what about delegated uh, legislation? And the second being about implied exception. So let's look at the first argument there. So we're going right back to 1911, that, um, that uh, Parliament Act of 1911. It said there can be delegated or subordinate uh, legislation, and that's so because it's derivative. Um, but anyway, uh, the validity of such legislation can be challenged. And Lord Bingham confirmed this. The late Lord Bingham ordered that book, The Root of Law. So what was the result in the end? Well, the first argument was rejected um, by the House of Lords. Remember, this is 2005. The House of Lords was still the Supreme Court as such. Supreme Court, as we know it, with the official title Supreme Court, didn't uh, didn't come into being until um, 2009. So the legislation was passed using the Parliament Act procedure. Uh, that's an act of Parliament. That's fine, said um, the, the House of Lords on this one. So they looked into what was the purpose of the Parliament Act of 1911. And they said the idea was not to set up a new kind of delegated legislation, but in fact, it was to set up a new way to enact primary legislation. Remember, delegated legislation is saying we're allowing you, the Secretary of State, for whatever, to sign something into law. You are empowered to do so. But this is primary legislation as we, Parliament, were actually making the law here. Um, so um, the, the, the House of Lords found that uh, what was a restriction of the power of the House of Lords was not an increase in the power of the House of Commons. And sorry, their lordships, the, the law lords, when they're talking about this, by we're talking about the House of Lords, they meant all the lords, not just the law lords. Because remember, there were a dozen law lords, judges, that's to say, in the House of Lords, and about a thousand other people, hereditary peers, and then life peers. Okay, 
So let's look at the second argument advanced um, in this case in Jackson. Uh, th that was that there's an implied exception. So the principle at stake here was about statutory interpretation. Um, things can be delegated and the House of Commons and the monarch can pass legislation together without the House of Lords. Um, this cannot enlarge the authority delegated to them, the House of Commons and the monarch, unless, of course, the Act says that outright. But th there's an implied exception to the use of the Parliament Act under Section 2.1. Parliament Act procedure can't be used by the House of Lords in order to uh, expand its own competence. So looking back to how the Parliament Act 1911 was interpreted, um, so uh, Section 2.1 contains certain express exceptions. Remember, expressio unius es exclusius, exclusio alteris. That is to say, the um, expression of one is the exclusion of another. OK, and so, so Lord Bingham sat on this case and gave some crucial judgments. So he, he said there was not an implied exception in this case. And uh, his lordship said that the historical situation when that act in uh, 1911 passed w was critical in the judgment he reached. Remember, the people's budget being rejected twice, the 1909 budget, two elections in 1910, King George V had inherited the crown and the Tory majority in the House of Lords was blocking the legislation the Liberals wanted to get through. And the King said, well, you can't thwart this forever, otherwise I'll create hundreds of Liberal peers to swamp you in the upper chamber. And um, these Tory um, peers did not want to be rubbing the shoulders with uh, people they thought were under. Remember that um, George the, um, sorry, William the Fourth had to do the same thing in 1832 over the Great Reform Act. So anyway, um, the 1949 Parliament Act was indeed an act of Parliament. Um, it, it was a proper one, and that meant that the um, uh, Hunting Act was good law. So that's what the that's what the judges found. So plenty of other acts have been passed by invoking the 1949 Parliament Act, that procedure to speed things up, to only allow the House of Peers to delay things for one year. And Lord Hope, for example, said this was um, entirely lawful, not even particularly controversial, but it sparked off a wider discussion. Um, and that was about, uh, well, the repercussions for the Constitution. Are certain constitutional safeguards um, entrenched? Uh, people say that um, uh, illimited parliamentary sovereignty um, might be a bad thing. Perhaps there ought to be um, greater equilibrium in the Constitution and we're making Parliament over mighty. Well, there is a subtext to all this. Um, you could look at the obiter um, dicta of this case. Also, um, So this is what uh, Lord Hope had to say about it in, in his judgment. Our constitution is dominated by the sovereignty of Parliament, but parliamentary sovereignty is no longer, if it ever was, absolute. All right. So th th these, these things are always evolving. The law is always changing. So um, perhaps uh, pure parliamentary sovereignty is no longer appropriate. So Lord Stein was one of the law lords who sat at the case. And this is what he said. The classic account given by Dicey um, of the doctrine of parliamentary supremacy, pure and absolute as it was, can um, be seen to be out of place in the modern United Kingdom. Nevertheless, the supremacy of Parliament is still the general principle of our Constitution. It is a construct of common law. Judges created this principle. If that is so, it is not unthinkable that circumstances could arise where the courts may have to qualify the principle established on a different hypothesis of constitutionalism. So he wasn't... Um, throwing parliamentary supremacy out altogether. He said it had been somewhat restricted, and he was saying that um, a situation may come when they, the, the judge had to say parliamentary supremacy no longer operates. Parliamentary supremacy was created by judges, he's saying, in other words, which, which is contentious. So Lady Hale, recently uh, president of the Supreme Court, she's since retired. This is what she said about it. Um, we're wondering whether, whether these safeguards really are there in the UK constitution. She said, if the sovereign parliament can redefine itself downwards, it may very well be that it could also redefine itself upwards to require a particular parliamentary majority or popular referendum for particular types of measure. Well, indeed, Lady Hale, that came to pass with, um, say, the um, uh, Referendum Act in relation to the European Union. And OK, well, that referendum wasn't legally required for the UK to leave the European Union. Um, or there are other things uh, when, when parliament has um, uh, restricted itself for example, this um, about elections, that there were going to be every five years, unless there was a super majority, two thirds majority to call an early election. All right. And then that we had one election, according to that five year scheme, we'll have we'll have them strictly every five years. And since then, there'd be two elections when it's gone out of sync, when Parliament has called an early election.
So the legislation wasn't worth much. So what is the situation with this notion of parliamentary sovereignty today? We have to ask ourselves, what are the origins of parliamentary sovereignty? Um, is that really the uh, core political fact? Or is it a, a contract of, of common law, as Lord Stein contended? Um, and is there cons uh, part common law constitutionalism? Well, there are cases which touch on this. For instance, Osborne and Parole Board from 2013, or Kennedy and Charity Commission from 2014. There's A and BBC in 2014, or R, ex parte Evans, and Attorney General in 2015. So um, it's a hotly debated issue. Now, some people say there's a hierarchy within the Constitution. Um, there's, there was a European Union directive, and it seemed to clash with Article 5 of the Bill of Rights. Remember the Bill of Rights from 1688? Now, we chucked some bits of the Bill of Rights out because some of it's anti-Catholic. But anyway, this is, this is what was found by um, Lord Neuberger in um, our um, High Speed 2 Alliance and SOS Transport 2014. Is some people who are trying to block the, the, this new high speed rail thing. And Lord Neuberger said this. The common law itself recognizes certain principles as fundamentals of, of, to the rule of law. It is certainly arguable that there may be fundamental principles, whether contained in other constitutional instruments or recognized at common law, of which Parliament, when it enacted the European Communities Act in 1972, did not either contemplate or authorize the abrogation. Abrogation kind of getting rid of them, breaking them. And um, so what was in the contemplation of Parliament? We have to look back to the parliamentary debates even then. They might have said things they didn't believe. There might be things they, that they did believe, which they didn't actually say. We have to, have to read the mind of people who've died quite some time ago in many cases. Should they really be trying to second guess people so much later on, judges? It's questionable. So, so we now ought to meditate and pause about the Constitution. What did Dr. Mark Elliott say about it, who's a um, uh, famous scholar of public law? He said, arguably, points towards a British Constitution that, while still unwritten, is richer and more complex than is usually supposed, right? So really nobody what it knows what it is, it's just so enigmatic, it was uniquely so, the UK constitution. There are broader constitutional considerations to take into account. Now, the uh, received wisdom about this uh, has been altered somewhat by the European Communities Act, 1972, by the Human Rights Act, 1998, by devolution to the Welsh Assembly, the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Scottish Parliament, the London Assembly, um, and to some extent, even like directly elected mayors in Manchester and Birmingham and so on. Um, and also the idea of common law constitutionalism. So some people have re reacted against this trend. There's been a backlash. Brexit would be an example of that. Some people talk about repealing the Human Rights Act. I don't think anyone wants to get rid of all of it, but some of it. Um, and uh, indeed, there is um, this... Uh, face off between Westminster and Holyrood with re recrudescence of separatist sentiment in North Britain. So um, anyway, we ought to look at prerogative power next time. Right. So that's all for me. I, I teach people law online. So contact me and I'll give you some law tutorials. I can send you examples of essays and problem questions with model answers. Toodaloo.